Well, welcome back, Groton Bible Chapel family. Uh, my name is Gary Campbell. I'm the lead pastor here at GBC. And uh, before we get into God's word this morning, I want to share with you our vision for the summer. Now, uh, we've been asking you, I think, over the last three weeks to be praying for church leadership as we kind of weighed everything that's at play and really prayed into what would God have us do for this summer as we move toward regathering uh, in our building. And so this morning, I want to share with you the idea of house churches, of moving toward uh, uh, house churches, and this is something that would begin in June. Now, a bunch of questions will come flooding into your mind. I'm going to answer a couple of them this morning. But I'll tell you straight out, most of the questions, most of the what and the how, we're going to talk about next week. Uh, so before I answer the questions that are probably coming to your mind, I'd like us to together do a little bit of a thought experiment this morning, if you'll humor me and, and bear with me here. Let's just, uh, for the moment, let's just set aside or pretend, if you will, that the, the pandemic that we're in, the coronavirus thing, was not a thing. Right? And that this was the beginning of the end of spring, the beginning of summer, and the leadership was coming to you in a normal 2020, whatever that might have been. And, uh, and, and saying to you, you know, one of the things that we want to focus on in 2020 is this idea of covenant. Now, certainly our covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ, but also covenant community. And so as such, we are uh, going to launch for the summer, for a number of weeks, house churches. We're going to actually not meet here in the physical space of our new building, but we're going to meet in homes and small groups and pairs and so on and so forth. And we're going to worship together. In some cases, we're going to share meals together. And ultimately, we're going to come back after this season of meeting house churches and say, what did we learn? What have we learned about each other? What, how, what have we learned about God? How have we grown in intimacy and relationship? And we would suspect that God is going to grow our covenant community here at GBC through such a season as this. Okay, so now we can bring back the reality that we're in, right? This pandemic, the coronavirus, because let's be honest, that is the primary motivator for why we are making this decision and not just coming right back to our building. At least from our perspective. You see, we believe that God knows and knew ahead of time that we would be in this season. And so that he has something for us in this season. So we do need to have that perspective that this is not a necessarily a making lemonade out of lemons situation, but it's leaning into this next season, similar to how we leaned into March, April, and May to learn the things that God wanted us to learn as a church. Now, again, we're gonna spend more time on this next week, but I think it's worth saying this morning, and I can say definitively, from almost every measurable matrix, we are a stronger, healthier church because of this pandemic and how the body of Christ responded and God's movement within us from what happened in March, April, and May. So we suspect uh, that God is gonna do something similar in this next season. Now, some questions, just a couple of the big ones relative to house churches. We are going to give you some options in terms of how to do this. A house church might be you having one other person over and just having fellowship and worship together. It might be a larger group. It might involve food. It might not. We're going to give you options and let you decide. An option is a key word. We're presenting this to you as an option. For some of you, you're going to continue to meet in your home by yourself or with your family alone watching, and that is absolutely your decision. We do not want to rush or push you. In fact, if you are health compromised, whether that's related to age or not, we would encourage you to sort of lag our decision and our beginning to meet as house churches in June. And, and just one additional thing related to that, if you need help sort of weighing that uh, from a pastoral standpoint, uh, any of the pastoral team would be uh, willing to talk with you or the elders as well and just process with you uh, in that regard. Last couple of things on this. First, I think it's fair to say, and I can personally attest to the fact, that we have the full spectrum of responses to this pandemic in our church community. We have those who think that, that, that uh, we should have never stopped meeting and we should still be in the church, and those who think we shouldn't meet for a really long time and we need to be extra safe. Please be sensitive to the fact that the church leadership in this community we need to minister to and care for and be sensitive to that entire spectrum, no matter where you fall on that. So we'd ask you to consider that prayerfully. Now, one logistical note. If you hear this and you're energized and excited by this idea, uh, we need you to reach out to us if you're interested in being a host for a house church. Now, this doesn't mean you're committing to it, 
But if you're interested in knowing more, I want to encourage you to email Zach at grottenbiblechapel.org. That's Z-A-K at grottenbiblechapel.org. And uh, we'll connect you to the, to the process. We'll get you the information and uh, we can move on from there. So we are, in fact, very excited about this idea and uh, ask you to continue to pray on that. Next week, we'll give you sort of the nuts and bolts uh, uh, to this vision for the summer. So enough about house churches this morning. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is our upcoming uh, baptism and worship night. This will be our first real gathering together, although it is a drive-up event here at Groton Bible Chapel on the campus. And we are going to celebrate, at this point there are six people who would uh, desire to be baptized, and we're going to worship together, uh, we're going to sing from our cars, we're going to honk our horns, and it's going to be a great time to at least be able to see each other's faces, uh, to, to hear the worship of God's people, and to be together. So that's Friday, June 12th, 6 p.m. Put it in your phone, write it down, Friday, 6 p.m., June 12th. So those are the things that are upcoming we wanted you to know this morning. Continue to pray for wisdom, for God's leading, and uh, at th this point, I wanna do exactly that as we transition to hearing from God's word. Would you pray with me this morning? Our God and Father, we know that, uh, that this whole season is in your hands that you are sovereign over it, that you are in control. And even as we'll look at this morning, Lord, sometimes we hold in tension the circumstances that we are in and our belief that you're in control. And so, God, would you teach us through this season? Would you give us, oh God, humility and sensitivity? And above all, as we approach your word this morning, Lord, would you give us an open mind and heart to hear from you by your Holy Spirit? We pray in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we'll hear uh, from God's word. Good morning, GBC family. We are Bill and Annette Burdick. This morning, we are reading from the book of John, chapter 11, verses 32 through 44, from the Common English Bible. When Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying also, he was deeply disturbed and troubled. He asked, where have you laid him? They replied, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? Jesus was deeply disturbed again when he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone covered the entrance. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there is already a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd standing here, I say this so that they may believe you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips, with his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. John eleven thirty two to 44. Well, I want to thank uh, those folks who read for us this morning the scripture from John 11. One of the really neat things about this season has been being able to hear God's word, the Bible being read from different people, seeing their faces, hearing their voices, and uh, that just continues to be uh, a real joy. You know, this passage in John chapter 11, in this account, we see uh, this unique uh, section of scripture, this unique narrative, this story, where Jesus' humanity and his divinity, Jesus' twin natures are manifested, are demonstrated in one passage. They're juxtaposed and, and clearly identified. In, in other words, in Jesus' response, as we heard read, to the, the death of Lazarus and the grief of those around him, we see very clearly that Jesus is fully human. But in the, the raising of Lazarus itself, himself, in the miracle, we see his divinity clearly on display. It's what theologians call the hypostatic union of Christ, the perfect union of those two natures, his, full, uh, his hum human nature and divine nature. If we were to say this to ourselves from sort of an application standpoint, we would say it this way, that Jesus, because he is fully human, is completely able to understand 
my circumstances and in fact has compassion toward me. We'll talk about that word compassion later. Jesus, because he is human, completely understands whatever it is I'm going through. But because he is also fully God, Jesus promises so much more than what we often expect, settle for, or even can imagine. As we trust in him, if we will just trust in him, he has so much more. That's sort of the theme of our morning. And uh, so this morning, I want to begin actually by backing up. We began this passage uh, with the conversation, the encounter with Mary. I want to back up a little bit. If you remember, Jesus has delayed coming to the village and Lazarus has died. And Martha actually comes out of the village. She meets Jesus and they have this conversation. And then we get to the, the text where we'll pick it up in a minute with Mary. But in Martha's conversation with Jesus, there were two really important points that come from the three verses at the very end. And they form sort of the footings for the whole passage. You know, this, uh, this spring, uh, my family and I, we took on a building project extending our deck several feet. And in order to do so, we had to put footings in, right, to support the, the structure. In many ways, these two sections, and they are Jesus' claim that he makes to Martha and Martha's confession, are the twin footings in which the rest of the passage uh, rest. And so let's look at Jesus' words. Jesus claim, he says this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. This is verse 25. The one who believes in me, even though he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And so Jesus says sort of backwards and forwards, positively and negatively, he makes this claim. He doesn't just say, and he's responding to Martha earlier, right? Martha earlier has said, Lord, if you'd been here, Lazarus, my brother, would not have died. That Jesus is not just saying, Martha, I have the ability to raise Lazarus. I am the one who gives life. No, he says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He not only possesses the power, he is life himself. And he asks her this question, do you believe this? So Jesus' claim is footing number one. And Jesus' miracle that we already know the conclusion here, right, is the validation of that claim, that he is the resurrection and the life. Martha, do you believe this? Martha says this. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Christ. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are the one who has come into the world. Martha's confession is one of the high points of John's gospel. It is this trifecta of confession, and it actually harkens back to three separate confessions of Jesus back in John chapter 1. You may remember in John chapter 1, verse 41, Andrew, in talking to Simon Peter about Jesus, he says, we have found the Messiah. And so in her claim that you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, she's echoing Andrew's confession of Jesus as the Messiah. When she says, you are the Son of God, she echoes Nathanael's words to Jesus in verse 49 of chapter 1, where he says, you are the Son of God. And when she says that you are the one who's come into the world, she echoes the words of Philip in verse 45, where Philip says, you are the one that Moses talked about who has come into the world. And so Martha has this profound claim of faith in Jesus, of, of trust in Jesus. It stands next to Peter's claim earlier in John's gospel, where Peter said, Lord, to whom else will we go? You have the words of eternal life. And Peter says, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So Martha's confession is our second footing. You know, one other note about Martha's confession. Martha, you may remember from Luke chapter 10, Jesus is at the home of Mary and Martha, and there's Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning, listening to him quietly, and, and Martha, she's the one who's the frenetic type A person, right? She's ripping around, trying to figure out if all the details are set, or she's how I would be acting, to be quite honest. Um, and, and so we sort of have a little bit of a negative connotation about Martha as compared to Mary. At least I do in my Bible reading. This scripture should completely dispel that. Martha's trifled confession of Christ as Messiah and so forth is a demonstration of, of a woman of stalwart faith in Jesus and a willingness to trust him for what she doesn't know. So those, those are our twin footings. Jesus' claim is going to be validated. Uh, Martha's confession is going to be affirmed and confirmed. Well, that brings us to Mary. Martha goes, she gets her sister Mary, and she says, Mary, the teacher is here. And so Mary leaves again, like Martha, leaves the village and comes out to Jesus. 
And, and it's sort of insinuated in the text that there was kind of a hope that she too would get to have a private conversation with Jesus before he got to the village. But the entourage of those that are mourning and grieving uh, come with her and are there sort of as an audience. And there it says in, in uh, the text that we heard read this morning that she fell at his feet. She fell at his feet. And in fact, Mar uh, Mary, in her encounters and conversations with Jesus, three times is at the feet of Jesus. In Luke, Luke chapter 10 that we referred to a moment ago, she's at the feet of Jesus. Here in John chapter 11, she's at the feet of Jesus. And in John 12 later, she will again be at the feet of Jesus. And I think there's an application for you and me here. I think it's fair to say that Martha's posture speaks a similar confession. I'm sorry, Mary's posture speaks a similar confession to Martha's words. Let me say that again. Mary's posture before Jesus speaks a similar confession to Martha's words words. Well, what's the application for you and me? You know, we respond to Jesus differently, right? Some of us are very vocal and demonstrative in our worship. Some of us are more reserved. Some of us are readers and thinkers. Some of us are, us are act, uh, you know, are doers and we act. But Mary's posture and Martha's words both communicate a deep trust, a growing trust in Jesus. And it's a profound point of the passage that we can kind of take home. You know, Mary and Martha actually made the same claim or, or had the same exclam uh, exclamatory statement to Jesus. In verse 21 is Martha's claim, and in verse 32 is, uh, is Mary's. They both said this, Lord, if you had only been here, our brother would not have died. If you'd only been here. And you know, I wonder, in your life, is, is that something that you tend to bring to the Lord or say to him at times. I think corporately we have through this season, right? Jesus, if you would only show up or if you'd only been here at the beginning of this, this virus would be eradicated. My life would be so messed up. But you know, again, let's, let's step away from the coronavirus thing for a few moments. Lord, if you'd only been present in this situation, I, I wouldn't have been demoted. I wouldn't have had that strained conversation with my boss. It wouldn't have gone this way. Jesus, if you'd only shown up, if you'd only been here, my marriage wouldn't have ended. We would have been able to solve that, that issue. Jesus, if you'd only been more present in this situation, my son wouldn't have walked away from, from you in his adolescence. And on and on we could go. You see, we come to Jesus with the tension of our present circumstances, which are not as we would like them to be, and, and we bring to bear on that a faith that says God is in control. We, we acknowledge that, but we're not always able to resonate or, or harmonize those two things together. Because often our faith and our vision for what God can do are short-sighted, lacks perspective. It's, it's even with this summer, and what we're looking at for the summer, some of you might really struggle with that because our perspective is limited and short-sighted. But Jesus, because he is fully human, completely, not partially, but completely understands all of our circumstances and he has compassion on us. But because he is fully God, he promises and he desires so much more for us if we will but trust in him. Isn't this the message of any recovery program or of any counseling situation, whether it be marriage counseling, wherever it might be, is, the, is drawing alongside someone in their present circumstances, trying to empathize and identify, but ultimately saying, there's something better for you than what you're settling for here. And through a Christian lens and through what we see in Jesus personally here, that is the heart's cry. God has so much more for you, even though you can't see it, if you will just trust in him. Well, let's look at this idea of these twin, let's look at these demonstrations of these twin natures of God. We're gonna begin with the fact that he's fully human that we see in his response here. And I wanna drop back to verse 33. It says this, when Jesus saw her, that is Mary, crying, and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? Jesus deeply moved again 
came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Here we have, in essence, the definition of compassion. Now, in the Greek, the word compassion actually has to do with the bowels, even the, the intestines. It's the idea that this affects Jesus to his core, and he responds from the core of his being in his expression of grief and agitation. So the scripture says he is deeply troubled in his spirit and moved. Some of your uh, uh, versions of the scripture will say deeply moved, became deeply agitated, troubled within himself to the point of shaking. And there's both uh, an indignation, it seems like here, as well as sorrow in Jesus' response is physical. Jesus, as it were, has this response that, that comes from his gut of, of the whole scene where he just, it's almost, in, in some of the, the scholars talk about, it's like a, a snort of anger. He's like, oh, and he bursts into tears. Now, these are not the tears, different Greek word, than the tears of, of the wailing of a Middle Eastern mourner. No, these are the, the quiet sobs of someone weeping. As we look at what is known as the shortest verse in the Bible, right? Verse 35, Jesus wept. I was struck in my study in preparing for this morning uh, with the amount of scholarship that tries to get really narrow as to why exactly not only does Jesus have sort of this, this outburst, being deeply troubled and agitated, but why does he cry? And, and I read such thing as things like uh, Lazarus couldn't possibly be crying because Laz or Jesus couldn't possibly be crying because Lazarus had died, because Jesus knew he was going to raise him from the dead. I would contest that a little bit, because for Jesus, every death is temporary, right, of those who, who know and love him. But I think categorically what's happening here is Jesus' response and, and his tears, the whole package is sort of this uh, uh, composite cocktail of human emotion and loss and trial. And so there is grief and empathy associated with, I mean, the text tells us. He sees Mary crying, he sees the Jews crying, and he cries in sorrow. And I do believe he cries because his friend Lazarus has died. But Jesus doesn't cry sort of by himself, he's crying with them. It's, it's empathy, and he weeps. But Jesus also has this response of, of agitation or indignation, I dare say even rage, that's probably much more associated to the consequences of sin, uh, one of which, of course, death is. But even beyond that, if we are consistent with John's gospel, and the theme of John's gospel is unbelief. And so Jesus' tears are associated with grief and empathy, but they're also a frustrated response to the fact that it is, this is not how it's supposed to be. And death is a product of sin and ultimately of unbelief. Not only the unbelief of the Jews at this time, but of many who will reject him. Jesus' tears are proof of his compassion for fallen humanity, and that includes you and includes me. In fact, we could say it this way. At least I think it's not overreaching. I think Jesus' entire response here sort of embodies the five stages of grief that anyone who has gone through something similar experiences over a season. We know that according to Hebrews, Jesus has experienced all of the trial of human, human existence. And so we see here, because he is fully human, he understands my circumstances. He understands your circumstances. Brothers and sisters, he understands. He gets it. And he has compassion for where you are at, for what you are, whatever it is that you are walking through today. He understands. Jesus in his humanity. I love what Dane Ortland says in his little book, and if, uh, if you're gonna read anything this summer, I encourage you to order this book. It's called Gentle and Lowly. It's by uh, Dane Ortland, and it says this. He, he says this. He says, when Jesus Christ sees the fallenness of the world all about him, his deepest impulse, his most natural instinct is to move toward that sin and suffering, not away from it. You hear that? Jesus moves towards sin and suffering. And, and as Jesus' people, as believers in Jesus, we too should move towards sin and suffering, not in a way to, to join alongside, but in, in empathy and in compassion. And I will confess to you that when I hear of people's loss and sin and suffering, praise God, there is a, a move in me, you know, the Holy Spirit just drawing me into that. But there's also a repulsion because I, unlike Christ, am not sinless. There is a protective, selfish, self-centeredness that also is mingled in there. May we be more 
like Christ as we learn from him even this morning. Jesus is fully human. But he's also fully God. And in the rest of the text, we see uh, Jesus says, remove the stone. And then there's this little conversation with Martha where she says, Jesus, it's gonna, it's gonna smell bad. And Jesus says, ultimately, trust me, trust God. And then he, he prays to the Father. He says, thank you for what you're about to do. And then Jesus says these words. He says, Lazarus, come forth or come out. And Lazarus comes out. Now, there's some funny points here, uh, at least in our speculation uh, in, in my study that I uncovered. One is uh, some scholars kind of wrestled through this idea, you know, what would have happened if Jesus hadn't been clear in the specificity of calling Lazarus' name specifically? Like, what if he had just said, come out! Would all of the bodies within earshot of those who had died be raised and, and come out with Lazarus? And we don't know, and it's sort of a humorous, humorous speculation, but it shows that Jesus is a mighty Savior, the second thing is just my own imaginings. You know, the text says that Lazarus comes out still wrapped in the grave clothes, and Jesus tells them to take them off. Now, this isn't a, a, like Egyptian entombment, but I imagine Lazarus does sort of come out almost like, right, like a penguin, and he has to be unwrapped, and there's this kind of awkward moment. But then there's a subsequent moment. And I wonder what that first moment after he's unwrapped, I assume someone puts a tunic on him, right? And he is whole, he's healed, he's restored. But what is that 10 seconds or 30 seconds right after this has taken place? What is that moment like? What would define that moment? What are the first words out of Lazarus' mouth? Did Lazarus know that he was dead? Like, how does this all work? The Jews are standing there. They're all watching. Martha and Mary are there. And there's this seminal moment when the miracle has just happened. Lazarus is unwrapped and he looks at Jesus. What happens in that moment? What would define that moment? Two words come to my mind if I were there. Joy, utter joy. Just inexpressible and astonishment. Mind-blown astonishment in that moment. Well, here's an interesting point to consider those two things, joy and astonishment. Lazarus being raised is an analog. It's a parable of our conversion when we trust in Jesus, when we respond to his call in our lives. And if you've had that moment in your life, there is absolutely joy and astonishment with that, right? Jesus says to me, he says, Gary, come forth, come out, come out, leave all the trappings that come with sin, ultimately death, step away from that, shed the grave clothes, shed all the bondage to sin and the guilt and the shame, and step out from that into newness of life with me. And by the way, if you're a, of reformed persuasion in your theology, you will love the fact that Lazarus doesn't seem to have a choice. That he just comes out. But Jesus calls you and he calls me. Maybe this morning you haven't responded to that call. Maybe this morning you've never realized that Jesus can actually identify what you're going through, nor that he is God and he promises you so much more than what the circumstances that you're in and the future, the destiny that you are headed for apart from him under judgment for your own sin but that Christ through his cross has paid for your sin and he can call you forth to new life. This is a foreshadowing of what is to come spiritually. Jesus, because he is fully God, promises me so much more, ultimately, resurrection. You know, one other point related to Jesus, uh, the angst of Jesus' response and the resurrection here. Jesus knew that because of death, and disease and sin and all of it, he was headed to the cross. But he also knew the victory of resurrection. And so Jesus is fully human. He understands what I'm going through. He is fully God and he promises me so much more. And so this morning I would say, if you're wrestling with Jesus, where have you been or why haven't you shown up, that Jesus is here. And to be a little more specific, we are called to live in his name and to be his presence. We, the body of Christ, those who believe in Jesus, we are to be his hands, his feet, his eyes, and his mouth. We are to draw alongside others in that compassion because he is fully human and completely understands me because he has been compassionate to me. I, therefore, should be compassionate toward the circumstances of others. Because he is fully God and he promises me so much more, including resurrection, as I trust in him, I therefore should bring those promises to those that are in dire circumstances to consider what God might have in store for them, both in this life and the life to come. Let me see if I can illustrate this. 
You see, when the body of Christ lives this way, lives incarnationally, lives as Christ's uh, uh, hands and feet in the world, and living in this kind of response, lives are changed. They're absolutely changed and transformed. So I wanna tell you a story. Uh, this past weekend, we had the first ever uh, online or digital wedding here at Groton Bible Chapel. And so myself and the bride and groom stood up here and there were a couple of tech volunteers that were in the back and we broadcast this wedding on the web and a hundred or plus people got to watch. And it was really exciting. It was a special day. It was a special moment as all weddings are. But it was especially unique and meaningful because of the stories of the two people who were married. Lou Herman and Debbie Roch. Now, what makes a wedding special are the stories, right? The humanity. And Lou and Debbie have just a unique story that reflects what we're talking about here. So I want to tell it to you this morning in brief. Uh, Lou, uh, Debbie rather, came to Groton Bible Chapel through her former husband, Tom. Lou and Debbie, both, this marriage for them was their second marriage as they both have lost their spouses. But Tom came to Groton Bible Chapel uh, uh, through our Celebrate Recovery program. Tom was an alcoholic. And Tom was sort of at uh, an ultimatum place in his marriage and, and a friend had told him about CR and so he came to celebrate recovery on a Monday night and for several weeks he sat in the back and kind of kept to himself. He was a little reclusive and, and that was kind of his deal. But in the spirit of what we're talking about this morning, the Celebrate Recovery team, the family, began to just love him and love him and love him. And eventually Tom's walls came down and he gave his life to Jesus. It was an amazing journey to watch. And Tom began to just soak up God's word and be discipled. And he eventually became a leader in the Celebrate Recovery program. He was a gentle and sweet man who loved Jesus. And then he started to bring, somewhere in that journey, started to bring his wife, Debbie. Debbie, as she said, she saw the change that was going on in her, her, his life. And so she was open to coming. She too came with a little bit of reluctance and standoffishness. And she had her guard up in the Celebrate Recovery family. Loved her and loved her and loved her. And she began to walk with Jesus. And their relationship was almost brand new. The alcoholism was gone. They were both walking with Jesus. They were learning so much. It was an absolute story of God's redemptive plan worked out in flesh and blood. And then Tom got cancer. And Tom fought his cancer and he actually overcame it. But through some complications related to his recovery, he ultimately died. But Tom died and went into the very presence of his Lord and Savior. His destiny for eternity had changed forever. But back here, Debbie was absolutely heartbroken. Just heartbroken. And, and, and I can only imagine that, you know, she has experienced this new life. Her husband uh, is restored and they have this new faith in Christ. And, and then Tom's gone. But I would see her sometimes during the midweek in the evenings or, or of course, on Sunday mornings, and, and she was just forlorn. And, and sometimes she would cry. And I would give her a hug. This was back when we were allowed to hug. Remember hugging? But I would give her a hug, and, and that was sort of her status. Well, interestingly, simultaneous to this season in her life, Lou Herman was caring uh, for his wife as she uh, endured a long battle with the cruel disease of Alzheimer's. And Lou said that her, that her battle with Alzheimer's was something that lasted 10 years, the last two, maybe two plus years of which she didn't know her family or even ultimately who he was. And he described during that season that he actually drew closer to his faith and leaned into his relationship with God, depending on God and learning more of the heart of Christ through that season. And Lou cared for his wife right up to the end. And then she too died. And somewhere in that season, Lou's children were concerned about his emotional state and just the amount of time that he was in isolation. And it was his daughter who said to him, Dad, you gotta get out. Is there anybody you'd be interested in spending time with? And this is where the story gets fun. You see, Lou is an alcoholic. Uh, sorry, Lou is an accountant. Very different. <laughs> Lou is an accountant. And Lou said that he had this client, this couple, Tom and Debbie Roch. And Tom had known of, of Tom's, uh, Lou had known of Tom's passing because Debbie had seen him to do her taxes after Tom had died. And he said, I'd love to spend some time with this, with this woman. 
And so they began to spend time. They built this deep friendship, initially uh, built on shared experience, right? They understood each other. They had empathy, but they also had a common faith in Jesus. And ultimately, they fell in love. And I can tell you that, that their love, and I don't mean this in any kind of derogatory way or condescending way, was like two young kids just lost in each other, but a, a friendship that was sort of built and founded in something that was much deeper in the shared experience of coming through trial together. And so last weekend, they were married. It has been the highlight of this corona season for me personally to watch them be married and to watch their journey. I thank God for it, but it it illustrates something really profound that we've talked about this morning. That when Christian community embodies what we see Jesus do here, when we come alongside those that are grieving, those that are in any kind of sin and suffering in an empathetic way, but we don't leave them there. We, We encourage them with the promises of God to look for something better by trusting in Jesus for what he has. Lives can change. Jesus said, we began with this morning, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And the question he puts to Martha, he puts to me. He puts to you. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? This morning we are making the claim that Jesus validates this by his full humanity and completely understanding what you are going through and his full divinity that he has the power to even raise us to eternal life. I wanna ask you explicitly this morning, Christian, who are you drawing near to? Who have you formerly been repulsed by? And how can you be repentant and draw near to them and bring the promises of God to bear into their dark situation? If you this morning are in one of those dark situations and you've never trusted Jesus, and you've never heard this, that Jesus is a God who empathetically understands and loves you where you're at and yet wants to call you to something more than even you can imagine, I wanna leave you with one simple invitation, one simple challenge this morning. Text the word next, N-E-X-T, to the number that you will see on your screen this morning. And our team will reach out to you. We will connect with you. We will pray with you. And we will help you to move toward that next step in your life to to, uh, walking in faith with Jesus. That is our prayer. That is our hope. That is our purpose. That is our mission this morning. Let's close in prayer. Jesus, we thank you that you are not a God who is afar off, but you are a God who is drawn near, who knows our pain, who knows our valleys, who has experienced grief, anguish, rage, indignation, all of that, Lord, that you get it. Thank you that you have compassion in our valleys, Lord. But Jesus, we thank you that you didn't just come and be empathetic, but because you are God, that you conquered sin and death through your shed blood on the cross, that you promise us resurrection to eternity and even uh, just the abundant grace of this life. We thank you for the example of Debbie and Lou, that not only were they redeemed and forgiven and set free and given eternity, but you piled grace upon grace in giving them the gift and the extended mercy of each other. Lord, I desire that so deeply for those listening this morning. Would you help us each to take the next step in our journey, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.